Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to my assembly language tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to start exploring assembly language in the world of Raspberry Pi. Now, there is a lot to learn about assembly language, and I don't want to overwhelm you, so this is going to be a multi-part tutorial. However, I'm going to explain registers, vim, make, bits, bytes, words, nibbles, adding and subtracting, converting, binaries, hexadecimals, and numerous different instructions. And the best way to watch this tutorial is to get the code and the transcript that is linked in the description underneath the video and then pause your way through the video as you work your way through the examples and take notes in your own language. So I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. Okay, so here is our Raspberry Pi, and basically assembly language is one step above the binary that runs your hardware, or this hardware. And the assembler is going to convert your code into binary, and we'll be programming the ARM microprocessor in this tutorial because that's what is in the Raspberry Pi. And this code will only work with ARM-based chips, but by learning assembly on a low-cost computer like this, you're basically going to be able to easily use assembly in general because the only difference between assembly on different microprocessors are the mnemonics or the instructions that you're going to be using. Now, of course, the microprocessors are going to manipulate data, and you're going to tell them how to manipulate that data by giving them certain instructions, like add, ADD, and sub, SUB. And most of these instructions are going to start off as three letters long. However, you're going to see that they get longer depending upon different capabilities you'd like to add to them. And another great reason why learning assembly on an ARM chip is a good idea is because the R in ARM stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing, and that means that there is a limited number of instructions. So I thought it would be great to work with a low-cost computer like this, and I thought this would be the cheapest and easiest way to dive into the world of Assembler. So now I'm going to jump over and show you how to set up all of our tools. Now I personally am using Microsoft Remote Desktop to go and remotely log into my Raspberry Pi, and you can of course do this on Windows or Mac or whatever, and of course you could just go into the Raspberry Pi and do everything here just exactly the same way. Now the very first thing I'm going to do, and this is just the terminal in a Raspberry Pi, what I'm going to do is install Vim. And to do so, you're going to type in sudo apt git install vim. And this is going to be the text editor that we're going to be using to run and create all of our Raspberry Pi applications. And of course, hit enter there. Then I'm going to change into my make my working directory. If I want to bounce back and forth between the directories, I can just go cd like this. And then I could make the directory that I have here. It's just asm backslash and projects. That's how you put a space inside of there, but I already have it created. So I'm instead going to change to that directory. So asm backslash and projects, and there I am inside of it. Now, if at any time you get an error that says something like no space on device or something like that, what you're gonna do is go sudo raspy config expands or expand root fs and run that command of course you're going to have to type in your password whenever you do that and that's going to fix that error in case you have that and now that we have vim installed what i'm going to do is jump in here and start writing some code with it now if i want to create my file that i want to work with in vim i'm just going to type in vim and asm tut and follow that with an s and here we are inside of vim now this might seem really hard to work with but it isn't after you get used to it so basically there's different modes you're going to use and different commands you're going to memorize now if you want to start typing inside of here you're going to turn into insert mode and all to do that all you have to do is hit the letter i see insert pops up there in the bottom left hand corner of the screen and if you want to jump out of insert mode into command mode you're going to hit the escape key and then you're going to be able to type all sorts of different codes. So you can come in here and put a colon and then put a W. And this is going to save but not exit from your program. You could type in WQ. That's going to save and quit your program. You could type in Q and an exclamation mark. That's going to quit and discard all of your changes. We're going to jump back into insert mode here. So I'm going to say some random stuff and just show you some different ways. Of course, you can use your arrow keys to bounce back and forth between all of these. You're also going to be able to move to the front of the next word real easy by just hitting W. Whoops, you have to hit escape first and then hit W. See, just like that. You're going to be able to hit the B key to jump back to the beginning of words. So W forward, B backwards. You're also going to be able to type in a dollar sign. That's going to jump you to the end of the line. And then if you hit a zero, that's going to jump you back to the beginning of the line. Another thing you might want to do is let's escape out of this again and hit colon and type in set number. 
and this is going to allow you to see or put lines on their number lines on your screen so you'll be able to easily find any type of errors you have and a whole bunch of other different things are going to be covered here as the tutorial continues. I'm going to ease my way into using Vim. Now the very first thing I'm going to do here is just create just a simple little assembly language program. I'm going to show you how to make a comment. So this is a comment. We're going to put a at symbol inside of there. You're also going to be able to put multi-line comments just by coming like this and then close that off with a star and I'm going to delete this and then we'll start writing some actual code. Now for a simple program like this you don't normally have to put dot text inside of here. What this is doing is it's defining where your instructions are going to start but you can put it in there or not put it in there. You're going to have another part called data which we're going to get into later and it's just going to allow the assembler to know where the data part is and where the instructions are. But we'll get more into that here in a second. I'm also going to define a global here and this is going to define that start is going to be globally available to the entire program and then we're going to say start is going to be the starting point this is what we call a label and this is going to be the starting part for our whole entire program and we're going to be working with things called registers so and I'll get more into that here in a moment but if I want to move a value into a register register the very first one is going to be R0 and let's say that I want to put a decimal number inside of there that's how you do that and likewise we're going to be able to store multiple different values inside of multiple different registers so these are sort of like arrays so let's just go to R7 register and let's throw a number one inside of there and then finally to end your program we're going to say SWI and then give it the code of zero and that is basically telling the program that you want to exit to the terminal. Now SWI stands for a software interrupt and the R7 in this situation having the value of one is telling SWI that it wants to exit to the terminal and the value that we store in R7 is called a system call number. You're going to see more of them as the tutorial continues and depending upon how different registers are set we're going to be able to call other Raspbian routines and libraries to execute but don't worry about all that just ease our way through here. So I'm going to escape so I'm going to hit the escape button and I'm going to hit WQ and that's going to escape and save. Now if I want to compile this I'm going to show you how to do it with make here in a second so it'll save you some time but I wanted to show you exactly what's going on. We're going to type in AS-O and then assembly tut and O and then assembly tut.s which is our file and then we want to make an executable file so I'm going to do LD-O assembly tut and then assembly tut dot o and you can see there's no errors popping up if i want to then run it I just go assembly tut and then if i want to output some data which is going to be the value that was set for our r0 register i'm just going to type in echo and then follow that up with a question mark and whenever i did you can see that 65 shows up inside of there and then if I want to jump back into Vim, you can see exactly where the 65 was set. So this is telling us that we want to quit the program or, ex or exit the application and go back to the terminal. And this is going to be the output that shows on the screen whenever we execute the application. So let's jump back out of that again. And let's come in here and I'll show you how to actually create multiple different applications and then link them together. So this guy right here is going to be called assembly tut2.s i to go into insert mode and again we're going to come in here and go global underscore start and then start once again and these label names are arbitrary you can have them be whatever you want and then I'm going to go move and this is going to output 65 and then what I'm going to say is I want to branch to another piece of code that I'm going to create here in a second. So I'll go B A L. I actually could just type in B, but I'm going to leave that just the way that it is. There's tons of different ways to do things inside of Assembler. And that's where I'm going to leave it. So I'm going to escape out of that. WQ again. And I'm going to create the second part of this application. So I'm going to go assembly tut 3s jump back in here, go into insert mode by hitting I once again. And again we're going to go global part two, define part two, our label move and then here we're going to say that we want register r7 to have a value of one which means jump back into the terminal and then i can end it like this and escape out of this wq if we hit ls it's going to show us the different applications we created inside of here or source files we created inside of here and now if i want to come in and assemble all of these i can just come in and go to and 
and two, and then let's do the same thing for three and three. And then we can come in here and actually execute and merge these two source files by going load, and we'll go assembly tut four, assembly tut 2.0, and assembly tut 3.0. Then we can come in and execute it, and you can see that the 65 shows up there. So that's just a way to compile multiple different source files into one executable application. But to save ourselves a whole ton of time, what I'm going to do here, and you type clear in to clear off your scroll back, is I'm going to create a make file. And to do that, we're going to go vim, and we're going to call it make file. Go into insert mode by hitting I. And what we're going to do here is the make file is basically just going to make it very easy for us to compile our application. And what you do is you're going to have a target inside of here. And target is going to be the name of the file that you want to generate. And then after that, you're going to have a prerequisite. So this is going to be anything that needs to exist for us to be able to create our target file. And if the prerequisite doesn't exist, we have to create it in the make file down below. So let's go and create something here. So assembly tut is going to be the name of the file that I want to finally be able to create here. And to do that, I'm going to have to have a assembly tut dot o file created for me. Now you're going to hit the tab key, very important. You have to have that inside of a make file. And then I'm just going to keep this very simple and just go ld dash o assembly tut and then assembly tut dot o. Now we need the assembly tut dot o file to be created. It's a prerequisite for us. And this guy right here is called a recipe, by the way. So that's something we want to create. So I'm going to have to come down here and create assembly tut dot o and the assembly tut.s file is going to have to exist for us to be able to create that. Put that colon inside of here. And then the recipe for that, remember hit tab again. Get any type of error, it's probably because you didn't hit tab. And then we'll go assembly tut o and assembly tut.s, which we know is going to exist. And then finally, we could also come in here and type in clean. And that is going to allow us to issue a clean command with our make file to be able to remove certain things. In this situation, we want to remove all .o files. And then we'll go assembly tut. And we'll escape out of this guy and quit. And then since we went and created that make file, if we want to execute the make file, we just type in make. And it's going to automatically go and compile that for us. And then we'll be able to come in here and go and call for that application execute and create output. And you can see 65 is right there. Also, if we go in and click on ls, you're going to see the o file show up there. But if we go make and clean and then ls, you're going to see that the o files were deleted. Okay, so that's a quick whirlwind way of compiling as well as a little bit on using Vim and creating your very first assembly language program. And now I'm going to dive in and talk more about registers, bits, bytes, words, and nibbles. Now as you're no doubt aware, a bit is going to either have a value of 0 or 1. A nibble is going to be made up of 4 bits. A byte is going to be made up of 8 bits. And a word is going to be made up of 32 bits. Now the ARM CPU is a 32-bit CPU. And it's also important to know that 4 bytes or 32 bits are going to be called words because we are going to be referring to words a lot as this tutorial continues. Now the CPU, as you saw previously, is going to contain 16 registers and they're going to be able to hold a word of data each. And registers 0 through 12 are always going to be available to you. However, some of these registers are going to do very special things when they have very special values inside of them. Register 13, however, is a pointer to the active stack, which we're going to get into more here as the tutorial continues. And this is going to be where you put your data on the stack, and then the stack pointer is going to tell how high that stack data is. Like I said, more on that later. Then register 14 is going to be the link register. Now when an instruction is going to call for a subroutine, the link register is going to be set to the subroutine return address. Once again, more on that later. Register 15 is going to be your program counter, and it's going to store the address of the next instruction to execute. 
and it basically just keeps track of where your program is in its execution of the list of code that you create. And then you're going to see this guy right here, which is called the Current Program Status Register, or CPSR. And it's going to basically store a bunch of information on your program and the results of different instructions that you're going to execute. And we will get more into this as the tutorial continues. Basically, whenever, just to give you a little bit more information, whenever you execute different instructions, these right here are either going to have a value of 1 or 0. And here, if a negative result came about, this is going to have a value of 1. If a 0 result came about, this is going to have a value of 1 or 0 if it didn't come about that way. If a carry uh, issues after an instruction, which we'll get into carries here in just a second, that's going to have a value of 1. And then if an overflow occurred, this is going to have a value of 1. Once again, don't try to memorize all this stuff. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples so that you can see exactly how this stuff works. Now, binary numbers are going to contain, once again, either a 1 or a 0. And we're going to be able to combine those to make base 10 numbers like we're all very, very used to. Now, you can think of base 10 in much the same way. Basically, what the number in base 10, 1, 2, 3 means is that we have 1, 100, 2, 10s, and three ones. Likewise, in binary, you're going to be able to say that right here, we're going to have one four with the value of one one one. We're going to have one four plus one two plus one one. And you can see how all these values increment. Start off at one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and they keep doubling on and on forever. Now, if you want to convert from decimal to binary, and let's say you want to convert the decimal number 126 into binary, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract 128 from it. You're going to get a negative number, so that's going to be a zero. You're going to subtract 64 from the 126 next to get a value of 62. Move that down there. Since you're able to perform that subtraction, you're going to put a value of 1 there. Likewise, with the 62 that's left over, you're going to subtract 32 from it. You can do that, put a 1 there, and so forth and so on. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to convert from decimal to binary numbers. Hexadecimal numbers, which are base 16 numbers, are going to work in a similar sort of fashion. And the reason why we're using hexadecimal numbers at all with assembler is because it's going to be easy to represent binary numbers as hex numbers. And hex numbers are going to contain values from 0 the whole way up to f, and f representing the decimal number of 15. But just so you know, you can pretty easily go in and program a lot of things with assembler without knowing anything about binary or hexadecimal numbers. However, they are quite convenient, as you'll see as the tutorial continues. But the main reason why hexadecimal numbers are used to represent binary numbers is you're going to be able to easily represent four bits of a binary number with just one hexadecimal number. As you can see right here, we're going to be able to represent these four bits with the 15 or the F in hexadecimal. And this is just going to be 1, 2, 4, and 8, which of course, whenever you add all those together, gets you the value of 15. Now, if you'd like to convert hexadecimals to decimal numbers, so for example, you have a value of 2A7, what you're going to do is you're going to take the 2, multiply that times 16 to the power of 2 to get 512. 10, which is in hexadecimal and have represented by the letter A, you're going to multiply that times 16 to the power of 1 to get 160. 7 is going to then be multiplied times 1 to get a value of 7, of course, and then you're going to add all those up. So you can say it's pretty easy to convert from hexadecimal to decimals. Likewise, you're going to be able to convert to decimal to hex numbers through the use of division. Once again, you're going to start at the largest value you're going to have in hexadecimal numbers. Divide that by the value you want to convert into hexadecimal. You're going to get a value of 2 here. You're going to throw out that remainder. You're then going to subtract 512, which is 256 times 2, and subtract that and then get a final value of 167, then move the 167 down, once again divide by 16, get a value of 10, which in hexadecimals is A. Again, throw off the remainder, and likewise that allows you to convert pretty easily the decimal number of 679 into 2A7, which is a hexadecimal number. It's also a good idea to be able to figure out how we can add binary numbers. So let's say we have 5 and 3. Basically what we're going to do here is 0 plus 0 in binary is going to equal 0. 1 plus 0 is going to equal to 1 no matter how you do it. And 1 plus 1 is going to be equal to 0 and then you're going to have to carry the 1. So what we're going to do here is have the values of 5 and 3. What are we going to do here? We're going to add 1 plus 1. That's going to give us a value of 0, which we're going to carry the 1. We're then going to add 1 plus 1 again, which is going to give us a value of 0. Carry the 1 once again. We're going to be able to add 1 plus 1 once again because of that carry. Get another value of 0. Carry the 1. 
put the one here and that gives you the final value of eight once again pause the screen if you want to look at these but once again I'm, you don't necessarily need to know exactly how to add and subtract and do all these different things with binaries and hexadecimal numbers just wanted to cover it just to be complete you can see another example if you want to pause your screen and exactly how these all work out for you and of course it would be a good idea for you to pause the screen and go through and actually work through all this yourself it's really going to have a positive impact in regards to helping you better understand how different values are passed around inside of the actual hardware of your computer Whenever you're subtracting, you're basically going to borrow one from the left to make a zero into a value of 10 in binary or the value of two. And then you can go about subtracting one as you are needed. So for example, we come here and we try to subtract one from zero, we can't do it. So what we're gonna do is borrow the value from the one that is next to it. So this becomes the value of two inside of binary. Now we can go in here and perform this subtraction. However, we're gonna get a value of one. Remember this is two now. So two minus one is gonna give us a value of one. And likewise, we can work this all out to find that six minus five is equal to one in binary. And you can see here a much more complicated example of how we can subtract binaries. Once again, go in here, pause your screen, work this out on paper, and it should make a lot of sense. However, another thing we can do is if we want to subtract binary numbers is use something called the twos complement. Basically, to convert a number to its negative form, what we're going to do instead is flip each bit and then add one to it. So in a situation with a 7, which is going to start off at 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, we're instead going to convert all the zeros into 1s, as you can see we did right here, and then we're going to add 1 to it. This allows us to add binary numbers instead of subtracting them by converting the binary value of 7 into a negative 7. And many people find it much easier to then come in here and add all these different values so that you don't have to mess around with moving values like you do whenever you're subtracting binaries. And just so you know, if you come working your way through here using two complements, if you come to, um, to a situation in which you have a carry bit with this one falling forward, you just simply delete that to get your final correct result. Okay, so there's a rundown of how we can use binaries and hexadecimals and how they interrelate with decimal values or base 10 values that you might be very used to. So now I'm going to jump back into the assembly language and for the rest of the, the tutorial, we're just going to write a lot of code. Okay, here we are back in the world of Raspberry Pi. And what we're going to do here is create a Hello World application. So I'm going to go vim assembly tut.s. Like I said, we can get rid of this guy right here. So let's just go and get rid of it. And everything else here is going to be roughly the same. But what I want to do here now is output to the screen. Now, if you want to output to the screen, you're going to have to set registers in a certain way. First, what I'm going to do is set my R7 to the system call of 4. And this system call is saying that we want to write information to the screen. I'm then going to come down here and in the R0, I'm going to set this to the value of 1. And this is saying that the output stream that we want to use is the monitor. Then create another one. You don't need, it doesn't matter where you put these. Go and create another register or assign a value to a register. In R2 here, what I'm going to do is define the length of the string that I want to put out on the screen. So I'm going to need 12 characters there. And then I'm going to have to come in and load a message that I want to be displayed into register 1. And here I'm going to just refer to a string that's going to have the value of message. And then we'll exit out of that guy. And then we're going to define the end with this label here. And this is going to say that we want to jump to the terminal. So I can go R7 again, number sign one, and exit. And then here is where we will define our data. If we put the data part up here above the instructions in those situations, we would have to put dot text inside of it. We're just defining that everything that follows this is going to be our data. And then I'm going to define some data, and it's going to have the label of message. I'm going to go ASCII, and then hello world is going to be the value inside of that data. Then we can escape out of that, WQ, and call our make file, and then we can just call for our application to run, and you can see the hello world printed out there. So basically what you're doing, it's almost like you're hitting switches, and that is allowing you to say, hey, I would like to write to the screen, or in the next situation, we're going to allow you to 
input information from the keyboard. So let's just go back into Vim again. Now if we want to allow to uh, get keyboard input, we're going to have our 7 system call. That's going to be changed from 4 to 3. We're then going to define in R0 or register 0 that the input stream in this situation is going to be the keyboard. And that's going to be 0. Here we're going to say that we want to be able to read in 10 characters. So there that is. Once again, we can load a value into the first register, and then we're going to create another label here, and this is going to write, and this is going to allow the input of information, and then now we want to output that information once again. Now we're going to be using much of the same things up here, so what we're going to do, we're going to come up to this line right here, we're going to escape out, and we're going to hit the capital letter V here, and then we're going to hit down on our arrow keys, this is inside of M. We want to copy those lines, so we're going to hit a lowercase y, and then we're going to come down here and do an uppercase p, and that saves us a little bit of time in regards to we're able to go in there and copy and paste those guys. So once again, insert mode, we want to be able to issue the system call to output information to the screen, so we're going to change this from 3 to 4. Here we want to designate that our stream is going to be to the monitor, so this is going to be 1. Number of characters we're going to want to write. This is going to be 5, and then this will be the message that we print out on the screen. And then we can come down here to the ending part. That, of course, is going to exit out of this application. And then for our starting value for our message, let's just come in here and give it a space. Nothing important. Escape, WQ, we can go make, and then we can go in and actually execute this guy. Here it's going to allow us to input information, and remember I said that I want to be able to read 10 characters and then output five characters. I'm just going to type in my name, hit enter, and you can see that it went and not only accepted that input, but it also printed that input out on the screen. So we're baby stepping our way through here. Now we're going to take a look at some other different instructions in regards to how we can add values. So let's go and open up Vim once again. Now basically the different instructions that you're going to be using, let's come in and just type some stuff inside here. The instructions you're going to be using are going to follow this format. So you're going to have whatever the instructions name is, and like I said, most of those are three to four characters in length. Then you're going to have your destination, where the information is going to be stored, whether it's in a register or somewhere else. And then you're going to put a comma, of course. And then you're going to have an operand and another operand. And in some situations, these operands can be numbers or they can or they must be registers. And as you go through, you'll be able to figure out exactly how those work. But what we're going to do here is just cover add. So let's come in here. This is going to be pretty simple. Down here, escape out of that. Capital V once again, because we're going to be deleting a whole bunch of different things. And hit D. There, that's gone. Insert mode. And we're not going to need any data in this situation. So once again, escape, capital letter V, and let's get rid of that, and delete. Go back into insert mode, and we'll come up here and add some values. Now you're going to be able to use hexadecimal numbers or regular decimal numbers or binary, so why don't I just do that? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to register 1, and if I want to put a hexadecimal number inside of here, I'm going to go 0, that is, and then I'm going to put an X and an A. I'm down here to the 0 register. Or actually, let's come up here and let's use add. So I'm going to say add. I'm going to that's going to be R0 is going to be the destination. Whatever value is in R1 is the first operand that I want to then add. And then I'm going to create another hexadecimal, and this is going to be 14. So what I'm basically saying here is I want to add 10 plus 20 using hexadecimal values. And then I'm going to come over here, escape out of this, and delete all this stuff, and escape out of everything altogether. We could type in make, and it says, whoops, undefined symbol x14. Well, it looks like I forgot to put the zero inside of there. No problem. Jump into there, and yes, you can indeed see that I did forget to put that inside of there. Insert mode, zero, exit, wq. Now we can do a make, and you can see everything went and executed perfectly fine. I want to come in here and execute this guy, and I want to echo the final result out onto the screen. So just go echo, dollar sign, question mark. And there you can see I was able to go in there and add those hexadecimal numbers, but you can also see that whenever I executed it, that it didn't come back as a hexadecimal number or a result, it came back as a decimal value of 30. So now let's jump in here and let's subtract some values. Basically, we're gonna do everything in exactly the same way. So let's go down here to register one 
and let's give this a value of 14. We can then come in and replace add with subtract, and then we'll come in and we'll change this to A or 10. Once again, escape out of that, WQ, make, and if we come in and execute it, you can see that we get the value of 10. And you can do a lot more complicated things with add and subtract, but just wanted to keep this quite simple. So let's clear our scroll back. We can also come in and multiply values. Open this back up again. And we got our register one. Let's just leave the values basically exactly the same. Except in this situation, we're not allowed to come in and actually use real numbers. We have to actually create or store the values inside of registers whenever we're multiplying them, unlike with add and subtract. So we'll just store a value inside of a register instead. And then we'll change this to multiply and change this to R2 for the second operand. Everything else stays exactly the same. Jump out of there, make, execute, and you can see we got a value of 200. Another thing that we can do is, let's open up Vim again. We can use something called multiply with accumulate. And basically what that's gonna do is multiply the first two register values and then add that to the last register value. Probably easier to just come in here and do this. So let's just leave this B14, leave this B10. Let's come in here and create or store another value in a register. So we'll use register R3 this time, store the value of five inside of there. And then instead of multiply, we're gonna use MLA. Once again, it's multiply with accumulate. And you'll see exactly how that works out. So we're going to be storing everything in the zero register and the zero register is what's going to output onto our screen. We're then going to take the operands of R1 and R2. They will be multiplied times each other. And then finally, we will add whatever is stored in register R, or register three to the multiplication of R1 plus R2. Escape, WQ, make, and echo. And you can see the 205 comes back. And we'll get more into why multiply with accumulate is actually useful. Another thing, wanted to come in here to Vim. Very often you'll wanna, you'll come in here, let's just change this to anything. Let's change this to one. And you'll come into a situation in which you want to undo a previous action. Just go into the command line once again and just hit U. And you can see that we were able to easily come in here and undo that. And control R is gonna allow us to redo an undone action. So you can easily jump back and forth between those different things. But of course I wanna keep that as zero. And now I'm gonna jump over and talk about branching, which is going to allow us to do a lot more interesting things. Now basically branch instructions are going to allow us to execute different instructions depending upon different conditions. And register 15 is the program counter and it's going to store the address of the next instruction that we want to execute as we saw previously in the tutorial. And after the instruction executes, the program counter is gonna be incremented by four bytes because each instruction is going to be allocated four bytes. We can, however, change how much the program counter increments and execute instructions out of order. And this amazing little tool is what is known as branching. So we're gonna come in here and let's just go and create or delete a whole bunch of these different things. So let's just come in and let's change this to register zero. And we can store 14 inside of there once again if we'd like, or the decimal number of 20. And then in this situation, we're gonna come in here and we are going to branch or we're gonna to jump to a label that is called other. And we'll go and store inside of the zero register, a value of 11 or B. And then we'll come down here and delete all these different things and we'll define other here again. I like to use underscore sometimes, sometimes I didn't, but because I didn't put it up there, I'm not gonna put it here in this situation. And then for this label here, basically what we're going to prove is the value of 11 is never going to be stored in R0 because we came down here, we executed start, we moved the 14 inside of register zero, then we said B other or branch to other. It's gonna jump here, it's gonna skip this line, it's gonna jump down here, and then it's gonna come in and end our program without actually ever executing this line of code. And if that indeed is true, whenever we execute this, it's going to output the value of 20, instead of outputting the value of 11. So let's come in here and let's see if it's right. Make and execute. And you can see the 20 shows up. So basically branching just allows us to skip around inside of our application, which is extremely useful. Now previously I mentioned the current program status register and what's going to be useful with it is it's going to store information about the program, such as operation results, and like I said before, it's going to set a bit to the value of one if conditions occurred. So we have here our negative flag, our zero flag, our carry flag, and our overflow flag. 
Now the negative flag is going to be set anytime a result of a calculation is going to give a negative result. Here this is going to give a value of 1 if the result is 0. This will have a positive or a true result if a carry actually exists and we talked about how carries work with binary addition previously. And this or the overflow flag is going to be set if the result overflowed into the 31st bit which is going to be used to signify the sign of a value. And we're going to use B followed by two codes basically to see if these values are either set or they are not set as you'll see in the example here in a second. Let's go back inside of Vim and basically how we're going to check if those different flags are going to be set or not is through the use of the compare instruction and the compare instruction just as CMP and so for example we'd say we want to compare the value that is set for register 1 versus the value that is set for register 2. Values are basically going to be compared by subtracting R2 from R1 or the values that are stored in those registers and whenever this instruction is executed we can then check our CPSR flags and then conditionally execute using branching like we saw before. So basically what we're going to do here is if R2 is greater than R1 then in that situation the negative flag would be enabled because the result of this subtraction is going to be a negative value. On the other hand if R2 is less than R1 then the negative flag wouldn't be set in that situation. And then if we come into a situation in which these two values are equal then whenever we perform that subtraction with those two values the zero flag is going to be enabled. So that provides us with a way to come in here and basically perform conditional logic. So let's just keep everything else here exactly the same and we'll go and we'll work this example out. So we're going to go to register 1 and I'm going to stop using hexadecimal numbers here because that might be confusing. And I'm going to set and store a value of 5 inside of there. And in the second register I'm going to store a value of 10 and then we'll perform our comparison. So I'll go compare R1 to R2 which you know that's a subtraction and then I can come in and go BEQ and what this is doing is it's going to say branch if these values are equal. If they are equal I want to jump to the label called values equal. Then I can throw in another branch and this is going to be that I want to branch. Now let's do BGT. I want to branch if register 1 is greater. And let's go and jump to a label called R1GT just for the heck of it. So now let's come in and define these different guys. Let's just go and replace this one and go R1 less than to handle the other situation that we might come about. And here I'm going to store, remember, whatever the value for register 0 is, that's what's going to output on the screen. So I'm going to change this to 2. So basically if R1 is less than R2, we're going to output on the screen the value of 2. And here I'm going to branch to the end of our application and then I'll just work out all the other results. So we'll go the greater than situation and in that situation we'll change this to the move and in that situation we'll put a value of 3 inside of there and jump again to the end of our application. And if the values are equal, likewise we can go move and we will put a value of 1 inside of there. We of course know that R1 is going to be less than 10, so we also know that we can expect the value of 2 to actually show up on the screen after this executes. Don't need to put a branch to end here because we're at the end of that, so we're just going to create end and move into R7 saying that we want to jump out to the terminal, that we are done, and there we go. Escape out of that, make it, and then execute it. And you can see the value of 2 shows up. So there you go guys, that is a rough overview of a whole bunch of things we're going to be covering with assembly language using Raspberry Pi. We're going to get into a lot more cool things whenever we get into the next part of the tutorial. Just didn't want to overwhelm you here, just start off. And just like always, please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.